You remember back in the days of school when you get this one of those teachers who kind of has a habit of coming in totally unannounced and says, surprise to teachers. That uh, surprise tests are supposed to fert out those who are ready from those who are not, uh, and those who the students are always prepared for those who are not. Um, but the reason I do is because I'm the kind of student, was the kind of students that kind of crammed up in two weeks. And I didn't know what to do with surprise exam. But then when I got older, when I got older, now I am all prepared and always try to be ahead of time. Those, those teachers drove me to it. But the Apostle Paul is not like those teachers. The Apostle Paul is the kind of teacher who warns you again and again and tells you that the test is coming, that the exam is coming, and he even uh, go over the curriculum with you once or twice, three times. He prepares you for the exam, and even the book exam. Now is the time to take a test. Exam. I'm sure if I ask the average student here in the church today, or even those of us when we were students, if I ask you about exams, most of you would say, I didn't like the exam time. But the exams and tests are the only way to determine where the student Exams and tests ferret out those who know from those who don't know. Exams and tests always determine the qualification of the person, and we have that in every profession. It will be law or medicine or accounting. They all have qualifications and have board certification, and I thank God for that. Imagine a guy who claims to be a brain surgeon, <laughs> never been through board examination or medical school. But in the spiritual life, it works the same way. It works exactly the same way. We have exams, and we have tests, but these exams and tests are always, always self-administered. They do not come from the outside. They come from the inside. These exams and these tests are for each individual's benefits. They're not for the benefit of anybody else except you and except me. And yet these exams and these tests count for greater consequences than any else on this earth. They count for greater consequences than anything else in your life, whether it be 50 or 100 years, because the results of these tests, the results of these exams can determine your eternal future. The result of these exams and these tests can determine whether you spend eternity in heaven or you spend eternity in heaven these exams can mean whether you have the lips of the Lord. Come, my beloved, the kingdom that was prepared for you, the foundation of the earth. Oh, hear the terrifying words that says, I never knew you. Depart from me. Have practiced lawlessness. That's the difference in the spiritual exam, in the spiritual test. Today, I conclude the series of messages, 15 Secrets for the Power of Positive Living, we will look at the exam, being for the uttermost test, and probably is the most thing. It's foundational to all the other. Amazing how the Apostle Paul would go through all of the second talks about these things that God taught him, and these gave him power to live positively in the trepidation and the middle of flogging, and yet comes to the end of one foundational. Look at verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. Test yourself to see, examine yourselves. He said he's talking to believers. I'm coming there. The Corinthians called the trap. Some of our ministers fall in it today. I keep up with what's going on in the And one tragedy of 
that if the students are not keeping up, if the students are failing, if the students are succeeding in schools, the standards must be high. The students answer is change your curriculum, make them a little easier so that the students can keep up the curriculum. So the standards, change the curriculum, don't insist on accountability. That's what seems to be going on in education. It is happening in the churches of Jesus Christ too. People don't want to believe that Jesus and Jesus Church people do. They would say, uh, let's just not talk about this particular truth. What? Don't talk about it. Truth very often. If it offends people, let's not talk about it. After all, people are the most important thing about the church, not the truth. Let's not talk about it. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this. And I thought of, I'm going to give you an illustration. I'm going to give you an example of how ludicrous, how ludicrous this kind of thing is. You know, the early 70s, I went to Australia. And in Australia, I learned that they play a funny game called rugby. I only knew soccer. And then I learned that they have another funny game called cricket. Well, I learned the rules of rugby, and I learned my father-in-law was a wonderful cricket, and he gave a and I learned all the rules. Not one time, not one time, any of these leagues, to yourself, you know, you are right here, and you don't understand all these understand. This never happened. I left Australia. I came to this country back in 1977. Of course, they have another funny game called American football. I don't offend you, Coach Gailey, but I'm sure you forgive me. They have another funny game called baseball. Well, I didn't know anything about it either, but I want, I want to learn. I want to go on the sideline. Game is all, but never. One did either of those go the baseball league came to me and they said, you know, you don't understand it. You're new here. I'll accommodate you. So we're going to ask the referees to just ease the rule. And we'll just have a free for all so you can understand it. Never happened. It's never happened. Pray tell me, why in name should we change the so it might be for somebody who doesn't know it? We should be teaching it to them. You get to accommodate to them. Because Paul tells us that this type of accommodation, this type of compromise will never cause you to have a kind of living. This kind of thinking will only lead us in a downward direction. This kind of thinking can only cause frustration and disappointment all around us. The more the church says God is diversity and diversity is God, more frustrated and because they are going away from the central truth. And Paul said, for true peace and joy, for assurance of heaven, for assurance of eternal future, in God, examine yourself and find out if you are in the truth, if you are in the faith, or you're not. Examine yourself and see if you in the truth, or you have moved away from the truth. It's your job, it's your job, it's your job. My job to know whether I or I don't. Examine yourselves and see if you have genuine salvation or not. Test and see if you're still in the truth or you have moved away from it. And God in His mercy, God in His mercy is not going to change the rules just to accommodate the people who don't like His rules. God is not going to change just to make it to the people who don't like it. He is sovereign God. He is God after all. And you and I accommodate to Him. He doesn't have to accommodate us. 
King David cried out to God, Search me, O God, and know my Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there is any way in me, and lead me everlasting. And so the question is this, who are the people who should be doing self-examination? Who are the people who should be examining themselves? Every one of us, every one of us, yours truly ahead of the pack, every single one of us, to refuse to examine yourself on a regular basis. Refuse to administer the test of on a regular basis. It is not only arrogance, but it is taking God's grace, it's taking God's salvation for granted. And God doesn't like that. But here's the news. No, no, no. Here's the fabulous news. In this type of test, in this type of exam, you can always be a success. And those who fail the test can succeed. In this type of examinations, to test whether you are in the faith or not, this I'll give you a big theological word for it. Heads you win, tails you win. How about that? What do you mean by that? If I examine my life, and I do on a daily basis, I don't wait till Sunday, if I examine myself, and find that I'm in the faith, then I will be overjoyed. I'll be giving God glory. I'll be thanking God for His grace. And glory. But if I examine myself, have moved away from the truth, God has a carte blanche invitation. He has engraved invitation to repent and come back to the truth. That's exactly. But heads you win, tails you win. Because God promised to receive anyone, anyone who turns to Him. The moment I come face to face, I am not in the faith, that I'm from the faith, that I've sinned gravely. God, in His grace and mercy, when I repent, He receives me. He embraces me. He forgives me. He restores me. Heads you win, tails you win. Theological term. So you don't forget it. The only loser, listen to me, the only loser is the person who discovers the truth, who knows the truth, and then they discover that they are not in the faith, and then they remain in their condition. That's the only loser, according to the word, is the person who refused to change direction. And Paul told the Corinthians, examine yourselves, examine yourselves. And when he said that, you know what? passed the test. He really was. I'm going to show it to you from the Word of God. He was very confident that they'll pass the exam and to see Christ in them. Listen to what he said, letter part of five. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail. That I'm in the faith. How close my eyes in death this afternoon. I will be in the presence of God without a shadow of doubt. How do I know that I'm truly born of God? How do I know? Sure. Somebody says, well, my faith so many years ago, I don't remember Not necessarily. Some says, well, you know, I prayed a long time ago. Would that be it? Not necessarily. So, you know, I've been baptized, not even once. I've been baptized several times. Every church I go to, I get baptized. <laughs> God bless you. Would that it? No, not necessarily. You can be baptized every morning if you like. I believe that Jesus is Would that be it? Yes. Not necessarily. The demons believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible said they believe and they tremble. They do. They 
part of the day of judgment. Do you know why? Because they read the Bible, and I do. They know that they're dead going to be sent into the lake of fire. They know that. They know that. They know the Bible. So let me give you four questions. If you just write them down. I have used them in my own life many a time, and I share them with you. That you can ask yourself to ascertain, are you in the faith? Are you in the truth? Are you born again? Will you open them in heaven? Four questions. Question one. Are you eager to confess sins the moment you sin? Or do you try to rationalize your sins? Or do you try to explain away your sin and say, well, you know, Michael, you don't understand. I'm I the pressure, and that just happened. Or my circumstances were as such that uh, I just could not be avoided. No, no, no. Listen to what Jesus said. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. The Bible said that those who confess will obtain mercy and forgiveness. Many people of sin as negative. I've heard this with my own ears. So we didn't talk about such negative connotation. Sin is negative. Well, I agree with you. Sin is negative. <laughs> we don't want to turn people off. I promise you, you're turning them off from God. How would you come to the positive of experiencing forgiveness and restoration until you deal with the negative of confession of sin? In fact, God sees confession as very positive. The Bible is the most positive step that you can take in your life. It's the most positive step for healing. It's the most positive step for salvation. It is the most positive step for peace. It is the most positive step for joy. God said it is the only way for real confidence and real assurance that you are in the faith. And that's very positive. Very positive. Question number two. Hunger and thirst. Jesus again, Matthew 5. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are truly redeemed. That's literal translation. It doesn't mean that you never fail. Don't understand me. It doesn't mean that sometimes you blow up the whole point of confession. It doesn't mean that at all. We're not into perfection here. But what I'm talking about is an aversion to sin and desire for righteousness. Deep down in your heart, you have a longing for righteousness in your relationship with the Lord, for righteousness in your relationship with others. And that is the one great indication if you are in the faith or not. You know, the by Jesus did all the right thing as far as the external life is concerned, as far as the outward appearance is concerned. They did the right thing. And the reason they were condemned by Jesus is because they did not have a longing for righteousness. That's why. Whether others are watching you or not, you're hungering for righteousness. Whether others know it or not. You're hungering for righteousness. Whether others oppose you or approve of you, you are hungering for righteousness. Whether others appreciate you or don't appreciate you, you are hungering for righteousness. Mourning over sin. Hungering for righteousness. The third question, to test yourself to see if you're in the faith or not, is this. Do I submit to the authority of God's Word. Oh, do I try to just explain it away? My life is busy. I'm, I'm running around, and everybody does it. Today is a different day. Surely God doesn't expect me to pay a price for following Him. Surely God… and on and on and on. No. That could not be further from the truth. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. If you love me, 
you obey my commandments. He did not say, obey my commandments if the price is right. He did not say, obey my commandments if the environment is conducive. He did not say, obey my commandments if everybody agrees with you. He did not say, obey my commandments if your friends are not against it. No, 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 no. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And in John 8, 31, he said, if you abide in me, you submit to my word. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Do you mourn over your sin? Or do you rationalize it? Do you hunger for righteousness? Do you submit to the authority of the Word of God? Question number four. Do you genuinely love God and love others? In 1 John 5, 2, the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he said, the proof of our genuine faith is our love for the Lord. And just in case somebody glibly said, well, yeah, I love God. The question is, how do you love God? How do you express love for God? How do you do it? Do you do it in words only? Or you do it tangibly, sacrificially? Oh, not only that, but in, also in 1 John 3, 14, he says, loving other believers is a clear indication that you have passed from death to life. First John chapter 3, verse 14. Look, there's no use saying, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I believe and I made my profession of faith and I've been through the, all the motions. And you have deep hatred for a brother in Christ. I won't cut it. <laughs> this is not, I don't make the rule. I'll tell you about them. Ask yourself, are you in the faith? Question number one, are you eager to confess your sin immediately when you fall into them? Or do you explain them away? Question number two, do I hunger for righteousness? Question number three, do I submit to the authority of the Scripture? Number four, do I love God and others? If your answer to all four questions is yes, 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 then give thanks to God. Praise Him for His grace and mercy. Give glory to God. But if your answer is no to any or all these questions, you can begin. Today you can start again. You can say, Lord, I have done all the external things. I got baptized. I joined the church. I've done all the things that I thought I'm supposed to do in order to think that I'm a Christian. But deep I don't mourn over my sin, and I don't hunger for righteousness. I do not love you with my whole heart. I don't love my brothers and sisters in Christ with my whole heart. Come into my life. Dwell in me. I can ask one prayer that God seconds, and he will come and dwell in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. How to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you God's love for you and explore how to experience His forgiveness. have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, seven steps in your faith adventure will help guide you in fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet.